Welcome. I'm going to get started uh, with the introduction. And I'm Denise Wardrop, Executive Director of the Chesapeake Research Consortium and a uh, monthly virtual seminar series. Our intention is to host targeted, inclusive, and informed conversations matching scientific advances and management needs. And um, these webinars are designed for contribution, not consumption. And so each seminar has invited a diverse range of researchers, managers, and other professionals to have conversations around critical topics. Its objective is to build connectivity between all of us and increase our collective competency for decision-making. As a reflection of that intent, the panelists have been given about 25 minutes total to make some introductory remarks, allowing 30 minutes for discussion. Uh, this is all about us and you giving a place to ask the clumsy questions and to practice the bravery and humility necessary for building the future that we want. At each of these webinars, I've begun by answering the question of why this topic at this time by these speakers, and I'm especially excited for this one. At this point in time of the restoration effort, engagement and communication with the public has never been more critical. As the decisions get harder, the solutions more challenging, and the creation of political will becomes necessary. The Conowingo provides a fascinating case study of changing science, the challenge of communicating that to the public, and the creation of political will. You can find headlines that range from the, describing the con a week ago as a super BMP to it being a cannon pointed at the bay. Why these speakers? Uh, they have participated in a long history of discovery about how these systems work and the communication of that science to public audiences, covering the entire cycle of making informed decisions. Um, we have three panel members today. Uh, Kathy Bo Boomer joined the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research as a scientific program director in July 2019. Um, Kathy's work spans um, a long uh, range of topics in watershed science. Joel Blomquist is a hydrologist with the USGS and um, the District of Columbia Water Science Center. And he currently serves as team leader for the USGS Chesapeake Bay Science Team. And um, he's also been a, a longtime researcher on the Conowingo. Um, and finally, uh, we are pleased to have Carl Blankenship, who was the founding editor of the Bay Journal, who's been tracking and reporting on environmental issues in the region since 1991. Um, and if you are not part of the Bay Journal community, we'll put something in the chat, um, please join. Uh, they have really a, a readership and a reach of about 100,000 people and have played such a huge role in communicating the uh, appropriate science around the Chesapeake Bay to the public. So each of our panelists have extensive experience and I'm sure each of them could fill an entire hour by themselves. But we've asked them to limit their remarks to a very short time period and, and that is a challenge. Um, panelists, I will try to gracefully let you know when you are at the eight minute mark. And if you have material that you're unable to share because of that time limit, we'll find a way to make uh, your slides or additional remarks available to the attendees. The most important part of this hour is the opportunity for attendees to be able to ask the brave and clumsy questions. Um, so please help me do that. And with that, I believe um, we are going to start with a quick poll. And if you would uh, go ahead and, and join us in that. Wow, wonderful. So a real uh, range of responses. And um, this is going to be really interesting to take the poll again at uh, the end of the webinar. So with that, 
I believe uh, we can start with our first speaker. Uh, just a reminder, I will facilitate um, the discussion out of the chat. So just to remind you again, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat when we get to the discussion uh, period. And with that, I believe our first presentation is by Kathy. Kathy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Denise. I, I'm really thrilled to be a part of this discussion. Um, I have been, I've had the privilege to learn about Conowingo since about 10 years ago when Constellation started their FERC relicensing application. And I was recruited to a review team. And then subsequently, I was a member of the Lower Susquehanna River Watershed Assessment Team and also uh, a part of the steering committee uh, for Stack's workshop on Conowingo. So just a, a tremendous opportunity to, to interact with a range of experts. And, and what I've taken away from these experiences is uh, we often don't keep in mind some key background or information that, that I think is really important and vital to consider when we hear bold statements like um, the, the restoration, the Bay's restoration is in peril because of the state of Conowingo or um, you know, Conowingo has the potential to act as a super BNP. So what are those, that key information that I think will kind of um, buffer that a little bit if I can, let's see, right, there we go. One is to remember that the lower Susquehanna River never had much capacity for storing sediment. Um, Second is to realize that the materials that are scoured from the, the lower Susquehanna River are largely inert and so don't have much potential or capacity to influence uh, the main stem conditions and the concerns that we have about the main stem conditions. A third really important point is to remember that the Susquehanna River has limited direct influence on a uh, most of the shallow water areas of the bay system where our living resources are concentrated. And then the fourth point is putting all these pieces together. Um, there's already a lot of evidence to suggest that dredging really has a low return on investment potential. Um, if I have time, I'd, I'd like to point out that Conowingo does have a very special place, not just in terms of its influence on the bay system, but in terms of providing water supply and and cooling capacity uh, for Peach Bottom nuclear power plant. And then the last point is to, to realize or to remind us that we should be looking at the full range of the dam's operations when we are evaluating the impacts of the dam on the, the river bay system. So let me just start by uh, capitalizing on uh, some guidance from Gregory Morris. Dr. Morris joined our stack workshop. He is a world renowned expert in reservoir sediment management. And one of the really interesting points that he made is that all reservoirs have a similar life history. It starts with um, soon after the, right after the dam is built, there's a continuous and rapid accumulation of sediment materials. But then as it moves into the second stage, uh, what happens is the um, high flow of water ends up, only the coarse materials are deposited. The fine materials, which is what the nutrients are attached to, remain largely suspended and move through the turbine system. So they're moving through the system as run of river. Um, and then the final stage of that life cycle is where the dam is completely infilled and the dam essentially acts as a waterfall. So clearly there's a strong evidence to suggest that uh, Conowingo is in this middle stage. Now the rate of infill uh, depends on the morphometry, the shape of the reservoir system, the volume of water and sediments that are moving from the watershed through that reservoir system, the, the rate and the timing. And Conowingo is, is kind of unique amongst the world's reservoirs because it has a relatively large watershed discharging through a relatively narrow bedrock channel. 
right? So it's almost like you're forcing the water during a storm event through this, you know, fire hose, yes, pointed at uh, the Chesapeake Bay. But the reservoir system itself isn't having much of an influence on what's moving from the Bay water, from the Susquehanna River watershed into the Bay. The second point to, to emphasize is, is that um, to remember that the Susquehanna has a somewhat limited direct influence on our Bay resources of concern. Uh, on a normal, typical day, the, the interface between that freshwater discharge from the Susquehanna and the oceanic influence moving up the Bay system typically occurs well north of the Bay Bridge connecting Annapolis to the Eastern shore. In um, two to five year storms, that interface might extend down to the Bay Bridge, but it's only in the most severe storms where that freshwater discharge might reach as far down as the Potomac. Um, so these would, would be the 10 to 20 year retor return storms. Um, importantly, that discharge is focused along the main stem. And uh, what this picture on the right clearly emphasizes is that the local tributaries, the other tributaries discharging to the bay where most of our shallow or much of our shallow water resources are concentrated are largely influenced from their local catchment and not from what's coming down through the Susquehanna River. Okay, so with that in mind, can the Bay region dredge its way out of the Conowingo Dam problem? First off, coming out of the lower Susquehanna River watershed for all the reasons that the, the geologic setting, the volume of sediment, the, the function of the reservoir system, all points to um, a complete lack of efficiency in terms of the value of dredging sediment materials from the, the reservoir system. At best, we could keep up with the materials that are being deposited, the volume of materials, the cost of dredging those materials would be prohibitive and would provide limited benefits in terms of um, functioning as a, or restoring that super BMP capacity. Um, if we think about the, um, uh, this is where I quickly transition to emphasizing that Conowingo Dam has uh, major implications, not just to the Bay's um, health and restoration, but there are some direct benefits and important roles that the Conowingo Dam plays in our um, Bay system or collective Bay ecosystem. So um, not only is it important for hydropower generation and recreation, but it's also critical to, to uh, hydropower operations at Muddy Run. It's critical for uh, cooling capacity at Peach Bottom. And then it's also critical to our water supplies for the Chester water uh, and the Baltimore water system. So for all these reasons, it is critical that we better understand and plan for managing uh, sediment in the Conowingo Reservoir system. And, and finally, just to realize that as the coarse materials continue to edge or creep closer to the dam, that this will actually put pressure on the turbine systems themselves, right? That coarse material will really grind up those turbines. Um, in thinking about reservoir sediment management, uh, the final point that I'd like to make um, for my core points is that the timing of the dredging and the location of that dredging is really important, right? So the materials that we might dredge if we're focused at the top or the head of the reservoir system will be mostly coarse sandy materials that do not bind a lot of nutrients, um, as opposed to uh, lower in the river system where there might we might be able to remove clay, we might be able to remove some of that um, long-term dead storage, if you will, um, but we really don't have a good understanding as to where uh, dredging might provide the most benefit. There are some that think dredging in the scour channel would be most beneficial to restoring the BMP capacity. 
And there are others who believe that it's essential to dredge in that, that dead material on the edges of the reservoir system. Okay, um, Denise hasn't dragged me off stage yet, so that I will um, take advantage to make uh, another final point. And that is uh, to get us all thinking about flow through uh, the reservoir system more holistically across the entire range of flows. And this is a great uh, summary, very clever graphic that Tara Moberg at the Nature Conservancy pulled together to summarize uh, flows through the reservoir system over time. And so two points. One, in this inset, you can see the dam's operations in blue superimposed on a flow at an up uh, at Marietta, just upstream of the reservoir system. And you can see that the, the uh, dam operations are basically essentially noise over that uh, river flow. So then when you look at uh, Tara's figure, you see that the dam system isn't, doesn't have a large impact on um, major storm events and the water and sediment that's moving through the dam system during those events. Where the dam really has an influence is on the low flow conditions. So um, here we have in the blue, the high flow events, the light orange indicate the range of typical seasonal flow. The red is uh, typical low flow conditions. The yellow line is the estimated historic minimum flow of the river system. And the black line is the current uh, minimal flow conditions that Exelon must adhere to in running their dam operations. Now, why this is important to think about, first off, the, the floodgates open at, at 86,000 uh, cubic feet per second. Anything below that, the water is moving mainly through the turbine system. And this is when you get a lot of debris accumulating behind the dam um, that over time with a more major flood event will flush out of Conowingo down into our bay system. The other reason to worry about those low flow conditions is to realize that when the extremely low flow conditions most likely occur are the summer months where temperatures are also warmer. And these are the ideal conditions for when you might have uh, nutrient lease release uh, into the overlying waters, right? So you, you create the conditions where you can um, release the, the bound up phosphorus into a biologically available form uh, that could have detrimental impacts to our bay ecosystem. Are you about ready to finish up, Kathy? Yep, this is my summary slide here. So um, just to, you know, where we are right now, there's the popular model that because the reservoir system has infilled, it has a greater potential to scour at lower storm events. Uh, there are other potential explanations or additional explanations, including the increased load from local catchments, um, internal nutrient release, and especially under low flow conditions. You could even, um, think about the measurement errors. And where this all takes us to is really needing to, to better understand the system through direct monitoring and measurements, tracking how the bathymetry is changing over time and being very sensitive to the timing and the placement of, those, uh, of that sampling. Thanks, Kathy. That was a great foundation. And we'll move quickly to Joel. Okay, so I'm Joel Blomquist. I'm a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and I've been engaged in monitoring and science of the Susquehanna River at Conowingo since 1985. I was born and raised within five miles of the dam, and for 45 years, I've enjoyed Conowingo Pond, as we call it, from a fam family cottage on its shores. Much of what I'm discussing today was originally published or presented in a one hour long presentation webinar from 2017. Today, I'll try to get more to the point. The infill of sediment in Conowingo Reservoir was not a surprise to anyone who needed to know. 
it was foreshadowed by infill in the two upstream reservoirs that reached max maximum sediment storage capacity within several decades of construction. In 1998, Michael Langland of the USGS estimated 17 to 20 years to full capacity. This information was shared far and wide within the partnership. In fact, EPA deliberately called out the possibility of changing reservoir dynamics when it published its 2010 total maximum daily load document. As we'll put on video so you can see me. At the time, the science was not available to support a specific strategy, but a commitment was made to factor in any change of conditions or scientific understanding through its two-year milestones. So how do we know the reservoir has reached maximum storage capacity? We have a team of hydrologic technicians that use rigid techniques to sample water from the Susquehanna River. Look behind. Oh. Look behind me to see the dam where we sample. We sample this at the outflow of Cano de Wingo Dam on a routine basis, or about 25 to 30 times per year. We space, place a special emphasis at high flow or storm sample collection, as these are the primary conditions where nutrients and sediments are transported in river systems. You can see them working hard on the catwalk. You can't because you can't see the picture, but they're out on the catwalk collecting water samples just above turbulent water coming through the turbines. Through a combination of sample measurements and stream flow, we can reliably measure the mass load of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment passing the, the dam on its way to the bay. Note that extreme events in, occur in, infrequently. In this case, we had an ice breakup event in 1996 a hurricane and tropical storm in 2004 and 2011. And data from these events provide the basis for many of our observations on reservoir behavior. We have over a thousand observations of suspended sediment concentration from the Conowingo site. And in 2004, we collected a sample with over 3,500 milligrams per liter. Until that point, 100 milligram per liter was considered high. And quite frankly, we didn't know how to handle this single observation. Our sampling team, however, was ready to see if those conditions ever returned. In 2011, Tropical Storm Lee provided that opportunity. And one sample measured nearly 3,000 milligrams per liter with several under other samples at or near 1,000 milligram per liter level. Fortunately, Dr. Robert Hirsch had just completed developing a new load and trend estimation technique. And he was poised to put these unprecedented measures into a context. The initial explanation indicated that the new sample concentrations were much greater than any previous samples collected during similar flow conditions. And a more detailed statistical analysis followed that showed a distinct change in behavior during high flow conditions across the range of flows. We were well on the way to confirming the prediction that Mike Langland had made several years earlier. Understanding reservoir inflow really required looking at longer term timeframes. Long term records allow to reconstruct the history of sediment input trapping and outflow. We were able to identify a sharp decline in sediment trapping in recent years with most of that change attributed to, to infill and sus, sus, subsequent resuspension of sediments. In the last decade, net trapping of the reservoir system has gone to approximately zero. In addition, we determined that this decadal scale loss of trapping assessed trapping ability was applicable to nitrogen and phosphorus as well. At this point, the larger science community engaged to address the questions for development of management strategies. Some of these included are the 2004 and 2000 events comparable to what we'd expect in the future? Is the nitrogen and phosphorus in resuspended sediments as bioavailable as other sources? How are these sediments redistributed within the tidal waters? What will the net effects of these sediments be on meeting water quality standards and what management strategies are available. 
a long list of science collaborating agencies gather and, and organizations gather to help meet this need for information. The scientific inquiries included a diverse collection of field data collection and laboratory studies, all focused on understanding the governing physical and biogeochemical processes associated with the fate of resuspended sediments from the lower Susquehanna. The, the graphic I had lists many of the different things that were done, but we won't go into detail. But these efforts engage dozens of researchers by, by organ, from the organizations across the region. A suite of study, the suite of studies and the models that were developed provided not a single solution, but multiple complementary lines of evidence to understand sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus resuspension and viability. And in turn, an improved Chesapeake Bay model was used to simulate the impacts of changing reservoir conditions on water quality attainment within the bay. None of the science could have been done so expeditiously without guiding collaboration to the lower Susquehanna River watershed assessment and the leadership provided by the US Army Corps of Engineers. The 2016 report provided a cohesive science assessment along with policy and management implica implications for the Chesapeake Partnership. Key findings include the watershed is the principal source of sediment reaching the bay. Reservoirs are trapping at a smaller amount of sediment and nutrients than in prior decades. Nutrients, not sediment, have the greatest impact on bay aquatic life. And finally, increased nitrogen and phosphorus from stored reservoir sediment have a quantifiable effect on bay hypoxia. The assessment conducted in an analysis of potential management strategies. The analysis highlighted that sediment management strategies concurrently provide nutrient management benefits. Three sediment control strategies were evaluated. The first was reducing sediment from the Susquehanna River watershed. This was determined to be a, of a high cost and low return, primarily because Pennsylvania and New York had already planned efforts in place, leaving little room for more progress in that arena. The second was to use bypass mechanisms to minimize sediment de deposition within the reservoir. This was determined to be the least feasible option of the three. And finally, increasing or recovering volume in the set of reservoirs or dredging was determined it would be very co a costly venture with long-term maintenance cost um, to ward off the new, the new incoming sediments. The, this assessment had spent most of its efforts on sediment, but as a re late reflection, they recommended a redirection of efforts from sediment management to nutrient controls. They noted management opportunities in the Chesapeake Bay watershed to reduce nutrient delivery are likely to be more effective than sediment reduction opportunities at reducing impacts on Chesapeake Bay water quality and aquatic life from scour events. In the case of the Susquehanna Reservoir infill, the science community has and continues to serve the needs to, inf to create informed policy and management. It has supported deliberate monitoring, multi-stakeholder science collaboration, coordination, multiple live lines of evidence and peer review. And most importantly, it's ongoing. So thanks for the opportunity to showcase how my peers have helped guide good decision-making and uh, hopefully sometime I can share my slides with you. <laughs> Joel, we can uh, send them out when we send up the follow-up email. And um, thanks for um, gracefully performing under pressure and um, extreme circumstances. So thank no, you. No and we'll move on to our final panelist, Carl. And we can see them, Carl. 
All right, this is my, um, let me get to the beginning. Okay. Yeah, this is my first ever PowerPoint presentation. So this is an experience in and of itself. Um, so I, I love Mark Twain quotes. And um, of course, he got to start writing with newspapers. And I'd remember coming across this a while back. And I thought this one might be particularly appropriate for this talk. Um, yeah, as you've been hearing, the Conowingo Dam is a huge structure. It was built in 1928. It's almost 100 feet high. It has a 14 mile long reservoir. And, you know, for us, it, it's been providing us fodder for dozens of stories, you know, since we started publishing 30 years ago. Um, our first article uh, that mentioned Conowingo, I think, was in our second or third issue, and it was dealing with fish passage. But the first article that dealt with um, the reservoir issue was in our second year in the June 1992 issue. And it um, reported on a US Geological Survey study that was just done that um, raised the flag that the reservoir filling was going to be an issue and that it could be filled within 20 years, which actually turned out to be not a bad prediction. Um, and this was certainly the first time that we um, covered the issue, but we covered it many more times over the year. This doesn't really show much, but um, yeah, this Carl, is just if, another. Carl, if you go up and you hit that button, play from current slide that's up on the, there you go. Okay. There you go. Um, but this is from a 2001 story, which followed a workshop. Um, and this one, you know, I think it was discussed as a ticking time bomb at that workshop. And that had all sorts of cool factoids. Um, like you, enough sediment came in um, that would that you'd need to dredge the equivalent of a hundred railroad cars of sediment every workday of the year to keep pace with what was flowing in. And another interesting thing that came out of that um, workshop was the idea that it might take a little bit longer than they thought before the reservoir filled. But of course, that was not right. Um, actually, within about a year of that, um, the USGS was out with another study showing that, in fact, the reservoir was filled and was starting to um, leak more sediment and nutrients into the bay. And that concerned lots of concern um, that um, several Maryland counties you know, claimed the impacts of Conowingo would overwhelm their TMDL efforts and they created a coalition to demand that the reservoir be dredged. And you know, a lot more concern started being raised about the impacts of um, the reservoir filling at around that time. You know, but the science evolves, and as you've heard from some of the earlier presentations, you know, over time it, it seems that the reservoir filling may be more of a firecracker than it was a time bomb. Um, in 2014, the Corps of Engineers and the Maryland Department of Environment um, came out with their multi year study, which found that the reservoir was essentially filled, but that, quote, the impacts may not be as devastating as what they once thought. That was actually a quote from our story, not their report. And the final report, which came out a couple of years ago, you know, pretty much reiterated that. Um, it said, the greatest threat to the Chesapeake water quality comes not from the sediment scoured during the large events, but rather from nutrients coming down the Susquehanna. They are no longer being trapped. And so, you know, the understanding changed from our first under article in 1992 up through, through 2016 when that report came out. Um, you know, while it was originally feared that the sediment scoured from behind the dam during large storms would smother the Chesapeake, you know, that report and subsequent studies, as you've heard alluded to earlier, 
you know, sort of the vast majority of what reaches the bay during normal years and major storms is actually flowing from the watershed. It's not coming from behind the dam. Um, further, the studies show that many of those nutrients scoured from behind the dam aren't really bioavailable to spur the algae growth, which, you know, leads to dead zones in the bay. And so the impact, you know, there's an impact, but it's not that huge. Um, and the, the context of other impacts of the bay, it's about a 5% increase in the amount of nitrogen that comes from the Susquehanna River. And, um, you know, the modeling shows that if all the other bay cleanup activities were implemented, it would re result in a small increase in non-attainment and a few of the bay's 92 segments. Yeah, you know, so it, it, it's a problem um, which needs to be addressed. It, it's not, you know, my, in 30 years of reporting about it, my relative amount of concern about the filling of the reservoir has decreased from when I first wrote about it. You know, it's still an issue, but I wouldn't lay awake at night worrying about it. In fact, I'd actually suggest that it's not even the biggest issue caused by Conowingo. Uh, when you build a hundred foot high wall, 10 miles upstream from the mouth of the largest river of the East Coast and make all that upstream habitat unavailable to shad, herring, eosturgeon and other migratory fish, you know, that, that's a massive ecological impact. Um, and we've written a lot of issues about the fish passage impacts as well. You know, so we've re recalibrated our coverage. You know, we don't call the Conowingo a time bomb anymore. And we spend a lot more time explaining things like dynamic equilibrium and sometimes in some long explainer stories um, like this one, which I think went on for about two and a half pages trying to explain the science behind Conowingo and some of the issues. Um, but despite the changing um, understanding, you know, the controversy over it has continued and it's often painted in really stark terms, um, largely because, you know, depending what side of the issue is on, it, it, you want to increase its importance, but, you know, it's been called the 800 pound gorilla in the room, overshadowing other bay cleanup efforts. It's been called a loaded cannon pointed at the Chesapeake Bay. It's been called called the largest threat to the Chesapeake Bay cleanup effort. And so in terms of reporting on the bay, um, it, it creates a bit of a challenge. Um, those aren't scientific views. They reflect the political positions of various individuals, groups. Um, and like I said, it serves their purpose to elevate the issue. And, this doesn't mean that those positions or arguments aren't important and they shouldn't be considered or the politics shouldn't play a role in policy. Um, but for reporting, you know, complex issues like this, it, it does make it really difficult when science and politics co-mingle and reporters need to be careful. Um, they're not, or they shouldn't be stenographers who just write down comments and spit them back onto the page without careful review, um, because that, you know, distorts the way people understand issues and they can put the thumb, inadvertently put their thumb on the scale of public opinion. You know, reporters should make an effort to understand the issue and what the facts are. Um, but, you know, again, that can be really difficult and complex and multi-layered issues like Conowingo. Um, You, you know, the science is really complex. And when you're dealing with like short pithy quotes, you know, the quotes can re really take on a life of their own. Um, you know, I was asked to say something about this recently at the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee. And I said that a key challenge in communicating these issues is the reporters can quote a dry scientific synthesis that talks about the relatively small impact of Conowingo, but you know, if it's balanced with a comment that says the, da the dam is 
a loaded cannon pointed at the Chesapeake, it's that quote that people are going to remember. You know, at the Bay Journal, you know, in some of our articles, we actually would take a look at the quotes that we use in stories on issues like this and kind of discuss whether or not they're over the top to the point that they create a misperception of the issue. You know, I, I will say when I look around at other, other coverage, I don't necessarily um, always see that full context or understanding of the Conowingo issue. Um, you know, it, it could be that in today's media environment, that reporters um, have less and less expertise in the subjects that they cover. You know, one of my colleagues said maybe some of them are just lazy. Um, I don't know, but um, it, it, it does sometimes work to distort an issue. Um, but in my opinion, a fair report is, is, is not one that leaves, you know, a lingering perception in someone's mind that isn't correct about the overall issue because of a misleading or uncorrected statement. Then just to highlight that point, I wanted to close with this um, alleged Mark Twain quote that I had remembered. Um, if you don't read the newspaper, you're un uninformed. If you do, you're misinformed. When I was looking it up for that, um, I discovered that's not true. There's no evidence Mark Twain ever said or wrote that, even though it's constantly attributed to him. In fact, there's no evidence that showed up before the 1990s, which was like 80 years after he died. Um, but it's out there. People keep re repeating it over and over, and they think that he said it. And so I think with that, that's all I have to say. We've uh, got an incredibly active chat, and I'm, I'm going to try and um, distill this down. There, there is a, a lot of chat, actually, about, re, uh, about the timing of uh, when certain reports are coming out and the evolving science and, and whether or not uh, when the opinion about dredging came out, whether it is up to date. And so I thought I would ask, uh, pose that question to, to probably Joel and, and maybe Kathy, and then I have a communications one to follow up, but, but um, is there a reason to believe that, that that assessment needs revisited and are you engaged in anything like that? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give a start. Um, personally, I am, say loosely engaged i would say the partnership in general is used to evolving science and evolving knowledge um we from an aquatic effects point of view have moved forward with the understanding that the material that's resuspended and delivered to the bay is less bioavailable, bio which kind of makes the, the need for um, dredging and resolving the sediment issue down and say elevates the need to focus from a bay restoration aspect on nutrient controls. Um, so when balancing resources and dredging versus whips, um, I think we still would stand in the greater benefit role as focusing on nutrients, which is kind of that last minute thing that came out of the, uh, the lower Susquehanna River watershed assessment. Um, but, but the Bay community is constantly you know, reviewing new information and trying to make the best decision possible. So I, I don't think we're, the community is ever really entrenched in a single decision. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy, do you have anything to add to that or? Yeah, Denise, I would say the stance, if you will, that the value of dredging um, still remains, we, most of us believe very limited, right? Again, from a volume standpoint, we just can't move enough sediment to, to really restore uh, sediment retention capacity in any meaningful way. 
And even the, um, the question about nutrients, because, because most of those sediments that are deposited in the reservoir are sandy, coarse materials that don't trap or sorb nutrients. And um, we still remain more concerned about what is coming in from the Susquehanna River watershed as a whole, more than uh, the internal sediment, nutrient sediment dynamics of the reservoir system. And this is reinforced actually by studies, um, the UMSI's published a, a series of papers in 2019, 2020, I think that showed that the sediment moving from the uh, reservoir system has limited impact in, in terms of the biology of the system. Again, because mm -hmm. it's not biologically reactive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one of the interesting things, and, and um, Verna Harrison pointed it out, and, and uh, it came out in previous discussions I've had with Carl, is, is the point about fish passage. <laughs> and actually that in looking at the Conowingo, we're, we're sort of losing sight of the whole package of things associated with the Conowingo and how it impacts a lot of the goals of, of the bay and not just water quality, right? So it, it has a huge impact on um, fish passage. And um, Carl, you've sort of watched the, the issues come and go. And um, why do you think that we get myopic about, you know, what exactly is the problem with Conowingo? Why did we sort of lose that attention to the fish passage issue? and have water quality taken it over is, can you comment on that at all? It, it's because there. the measuring point for improving the Chesapeake Bay, uh, you know, though the goal of the Chesapeake Bay restoration effort is supposed to be to benefit the living resources our measurable and enforceable goals tend to be focused on water quality, like with the TMDL and meeting attainment of dissolved oxygen in the deepest parts of the Chesapeake Bay. And so, you know, discussions tend to coalesce around, you know, are we meeting the water quality goals? And, you know, that's where my point was. You know, the water quality issue, um, you know, Conowingo Dam makes that incrementally worse, but with the living resources, it's an absolute closure to all sorts of priority resources. And many of them are resources that are in decline. And, um, and so, you know, if your ultimate goal is supposed to be the living resources, there's kind of a policy mismatch where the emphasis gets placed sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. There's uh, one of a, a kind of another question I think is applicable to all of you is that um, it's, it, there's so many challenging things about uh, informing the public about science that is constantly moving forward. And I, I think, Carl, you had some excellent points about uh, when you pointed out the attraction to a, a, a pithy quote. And, and you have the experience now um, and the discipline to, to understand the power of those pithy quotes versus a more um, sort of uh, balanced um, headline. And I'm, I'm sort of wondering if each of you, because you're on different sides of the sort of science communication coin, can you talk about uh, the challenges? So for example, for, for Joel and Kathy, um, when there is a, a piece of discovery that maybe shifts um, how you look at an issue, how do you get it out? Do you call Carl? And, and Carl from the other, you know, do you have trouble sort of um, monitoring and, and finding scientists who can kind of alert you to, to changes in science? I mean, how does that relationship work um, for each of you? Well, I'll start um, from, from my perspective and, and particularly from my role with the United States Geological Survey, 
how and where we release new information is is governed by science fundamental science practices and so we undergo a fairly strict review process even on very new science and we can get science out quickly with the review process and have continued to do that but as we're coming out with it into a more formal literature we most definitely like to reach out to people like Carl to help get the story framed in ways that we're maybe not familiar with that make it more palatable to a broader audience um, and that's a very, very important role that uh, Carl and, and people like him serve. Um, and I'll say we also work within the partnership within the Bayes Communication Office to help develop those stories also. Kathy, from the science side, do you have any thoughts yeah. about that? Denise, I don't work as directly or have um, with communications or publishing the science, uh, certainly not in the same capacity that Carl and, and Joel do. Um, the work that we do at FAR is, is more um, trying to help scientists hone in on the information gaps that are most relevant to the decision makers. Um, so, and framing that science in a way that creates space, if you will, for um, understanding the uncertainty of that science and where we need additional information, additional research to, to build evidence or to help us understand or have more confidence in how the system is behaving. Um, so I, you know, our, my interaction with the science and communicating and using the science in communications is very different and actually more targeted towards the science community than the general public. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kathy. And and Carl, from your standpoint, uh, you're you're if you weren't trained as a scientist, I think you're an honorary one, um, just from the, what you cover and your your knowledge base. But um, is it difficult for you, or can you talk to the challenges of of really? you know, trying to monitor that science and, and what's then important for the, to be communicated to the public? Yeah, it, it is really tough and challenging because I've personally, you know, spent a lot of time going to really technical workshops and things over the years. You know, I try to make it to as many of the scientific and technical advisory committee meetings as I can just to make sure that there's a core understanding of scientific issues and then figuring out how to transfer, you know, the important issues into stories. Um, but it, it, it's a big time commitment to track all that. Yeah, I will say organizationally, we recently took the step to create a science advisory committee to, um, with a group of scientists. Um, it, it's still a little bit of a work in process and progress, um, but we, you know, it's a group of scientists that we hope to be working more with just in terms of people who, who can serve as like advisors, you know, to help staffers understand key issues, um, you know, go back and forth on what's what stories, you know, what, what's distractions, um, you know, where, where the science consensus is on stuff. But, you know, the, a lot of the base stuff is really complex and it's really daunting. So. Mm -hmm. It, it, it does take a lot of effort to try to keep track of it. Mm -hmm. I um, wanted to just finish up. We're at one o'clock. I um, both apologize to the participants that we had a, a little few glitches, but I want to thank the panelists for a really multidimensional picture of a very complicated issue. I will say that many of the questions in the chat are technical, and so I think they're perfectly um, uh, wonderful to forward to the panelists and see if we can get you answers. Um, and that is usually sent back out a couple days after this webinar. And with that, I'll let Lauren had a final poll to put up. And if you could do that before s signing off and uh, 
Carl, I just wanted to tell you that you got uh, many comments in the chat thanking you for your coverage over the years of, of the issues. For many of us, you are a real go-to source. So um, many thanks for that hard work. And our uh, next webinar is scheduled um, for next month, November. And we hope to see you there.